behalf of everyone, welcome you to Core Volunteer Training. It's a weekly webinar program that we have for our newish volunteers to help connect you throughout the larger world and to become more effective in your climate advocacy with Citizens Climate Lobby. Tonight's topic is explaining the science of climate change. And to do that tonight, let me welcome our esteemed main speaker. We have none other than the wonderful Dr. Sandra Kirtland Turner, who has been an assistant professor of paleoclimate and paleooceanography in the Department of Earth Sciences at the University of California, Riverside since 2015. She's a former National Science Foundation International Research Fellow. Her PhD is from Scripps, where she also happens to know several other key CCLers, including Danny as classmates back in the day and since then has been involved uh, as now a Board of Directors member for Citizens Climate Education. The three main points that Sandy is going to make sure to cover tonight include highlighting an understanding of the natural carbon cycle as well as the basic concepts behind climate change, highlighting the importance behind the scientific method and peer review process, and how to really implement best practices in communicating this research with other community members and taking action to find out more information to connect with climate scientists local to your group. So to get us there, what we're gonna do is a five-part agenda. We'll have a carbon cycle discussion, how humans factor in discussion, a topic of the scientific consensus and going more in depth on that front, and then focusing on what we can actually do about it with a success story and some next steps. Pass it to you, Sandy, so that we can jump in and have a chance to really benefit from your knowledge tonight. Thank you for making it. Great, thank you so much, Brett, for that great introduction and thanks everyone for joining on the call. Uh, so I'd just like to start with a little bit of my personal motivation and my concerns in studying climate change and advocating for doing something about it. Um, and I think that's a nice lesson I like to give because I find it's really useful to always give a personal story, even when you're talking about the objective science behind climate change. Um, and I was lucky enough to go down to the Antarctic Peninsula back in 2009 on a research expedition. And the poles, our North and South Pole, are some of the most vulnerable places to climate change uh, because we see as the planet warms, actually the poles warm faster than anywhere else. And this also happens to be, of course, where all of our, or most of our ice is. Um, and if you melted, say, all of the Antarctic ice sheet, we know that that would raise global sea levels significantly, about 60 meters or over 150 feet. Uh, so, so hugely would change the face of the planet and also completely ruin this, this beautiful, beautiful um, ecosystem. Um, and so if we look back, as I said, both poles are warming faster than anywhere else on Earth. So if we go to the opposite pole than the North Pole, we can see features of that, like the fact that Arctic sea ice is disappearing. Um, and regularly, you'll see news stories about having a summer sea ice minimum uh, that's smaller than we've seen in the historical record. Uh, we also see that we're accelerating the melting of land-based ice all around the polar regions. And of course, that contributes to sea level rise. And furthermore, as we melt permafrost at the high latitudes, and that's, that's frozen soil effectively, we actually end up releasing more greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide and methane that can actually exacerbate or accelerate the warming due to our own emissions of greenhouse gases. Um, and so these are, these are some of the, the kind of canaries in the coal mine that we see impacts of climate change happening fastest in the highest latitudes on our planet. So we're going to start with just a, some basics about the carbon cycle and, and why there's this connection between greenhouse gases like carbon dioxide and our planet's temperature. Um, so moving on. Okay, so we, we kind of, you know, we know if we burn fossil fuels, and those include things like coal, natural gas, or oil, that that produces carbon dioxide as a reaction of that combustion. Fossil fuels are, you know, formed from organic material, the remains of once living plants and animals that have been buried, subjected to lots of heat and pressure and turned into these fuels. And we are accelerating our rates of returning that carbon dioxide that was once trapped by those plants um, back into carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So this chart, which on, on my screen just got a little bit distorted up, oh, there we go. This shows how we've been um, 
burning these various fossil fuels and releasing different greenhouse gases over the last few decades from 1970 up until the end of the last decade. Um, and you can see that there are a variety of greenhouse gases that are being tracked in different colors on this chart. And the emissions in billions of tons of carbon dioxide per year are shown on the vertical axis there. So the largest amount is from CO2, is CO2 or carbon dioxide from fossil fuels and other industrial processes there in the light orange. Um, and we also have CO2 from land use change in the dark orange above. Um, so that's if you cut down forests, for instance. Um, and then you can see the smaller contributions of methane in the light blue and nitrous oxide in the sort of darker bluish and the fluorine, gla fluorine gases in, in the blue. All of them have been going up in terms of their emissions to the atmosphere in recent decades. And the important thing is that these are sources of carbon dioxide that are not balanced by natural sinks or natural abilities of the planet to actually remove that CO2 uh, from the atmosphere at the same rate that it's added. So that's not to say though that the planet doesn't have the ability to help deal with some excess CO2. So when we release all of this CO2 per year, here it's in, an, in another uh, slightly different metric. Now it's um, billions of metric tons of CO2 per year. Uh, so that's a yearly rate. And um, you can see that in any given year, the CO2 that we've burned kind of goes into three different possible places by and large. Of course, it can go into the atmosphere. That's where most of it remains. Um, but some of it is taken up by plants that are photosynthesizing and using carbon dioxide to make sugars. And then quite a significant portion is also absorbed into the ocean. CO2 gas dissolves really easily in water. That's, of course, why we make carbonated sodas using CO2. Um, but this has negative effects because it can change the chemistry um, of the oceans and actually make the oceans more acidic. Um, and so we care about the, all of this carbon dioxide from the climate perspective because carbon dioxide is a really effective greenhouse gas. And the greenhouse effect is crucial on our planet. If we didn't have a natural greenhouse effect by having any gases in our atmosphere that could absorb uh, radiation being emitted from the earth after being absorbed from the sun, we would actually have an average temperature on the planet that was below freezing, like negative 18 degrees Celsius or approximately zero degrees Fahrenheit. Um, but if we go to the next slide, the problem is that our extra CO2 that we're emitting by burning fossil fuels is enhancing this natural greenhouse effect um, and just really amplifying it, right? So we've by almost half or almost 50% increased the strength um, of the greenhouse effect. So effectively, less of the energy from the sun that our planet's surface absorbs can make it back out into space. Um, before we began burning fossil fuels in a significant amount. We had a concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere that was about 280 parts per million. So we call that the pre-industrial concentration. And today, we're at about 410 parts per million, um, which turns out, as I'll mention later, is a value that we haven't actually seen for millions, if not tens of millions of years. All right, so, so again, why the focus on CO2? Let's go through a couple more details because I often hear issues about CO2 as opposed to other greenhouse gas. So, so there's kind of no doubt that CO2 itself is a, is a greenhouse gas. That's just based on its simple chemistry. The carbon dioxide molecule being made of three atoms can vibrate in such a way that you trap heat energy. Um, and that is an ability that's not shared by molecules in our atmosphere that are made up of just two atoms. So our dominant atmospheric constituents are oxygen gas and nitrogen in opposite order, nitrogen first, then oxygen. Um, but neither of those have bonds that can vibrate in such a way that they interact with heat energy. Um, whereas CO2 and other um, gaseous molecules with three or more atoms in the atmosphere can. Um, and so similarly, water vapor is an important greenhouse gas. It's just that the amount of water vapor varies significantly spatially. And actually the amount of water vapor in the atmosphere is related to global temperature. So it changes in response to global temperature. And so we can actually think of our changes in CO2 as driving feedbacks in how much 
water vapor there is in the atmosphere, um, but the CO2 dominates the, the initial temperature effect. Um, and we can actually kind of quantify this importance of different greenhouse gases by referring to something called the global warming potential. And there are two kind of factors that are involved in determining this for any given atmospheric constituent. And one is some of that basic chemistry, just how effective is the molecule at interacting with heat energy. But the next is how long does this particular molecule remain in the atmosphere once it's been released, say, by burning fossil fuels. And carbon dioxide is particularly effective, not just because it interacts very strongly with the wavelengths at which Earth gives off energy, but also because it stays in the atmosphere for a very long time once it's emitted. Um, an individual molecule can remain for hundreds of years. Once we've raised the concentration, it takes much, much longer than that for atmospheric CO2 to decline again. Um, and so that feature means that carbon dioxide is really our most significant greenhouse gas, even though on a per molecule basis, methane might be more significant at absorbing that heat energy, it, it cycles much more rapidly through the atmosphere, so it doesn't have as large of an effect as carbon dioxide. Okay, so let's look a little bit more about humans' role in a lot of this. Why do we know that CO2 particularly is the cause of the recent warming? Um, you know, someone might ask a question about correlation versus causation. Um, we observed global temperatures going up, we've observed carbon dioxide increasing in the atmosphere from human activities, but how do we know those two things actually go together? Well, we can look at a lot of the other things that are really important drivers of our climate, oh, sorry, and, and, and ask and see whether or not they've changed. Um, and we know that actually those things have either been steady over the interval of time that we've been monitoring increasing global temperatures, or if anything, they would be driving us towards global cooling. So for instance, we can look at solar activity um, and, and ask whether or not that correlates to the changes in global temperature we've seen. We can look at other components to our atmosphere um, and none of those have the correlation that carbon dioxide does. Um, and of course, we know mechanistically that CO2 should um, lead to trapping more uh, heat and therefore a rise in global temperature. So we can just kind of look at this one particular example of solar energy or how strong the sun is in more detail. We've actually been measuring um, solar output via satellite measurements since the late 1970s. Um, and, and this graph shows those data. So on the top, just for context, we're looking at this change from um, in global average surface temperatures. So it's relative to the amount of warming. So starting from zero, from some average period, and you can see this about one degree um, of warming in this interval in degrees Fahrenheit here. And on the bottom, we're looking at solar output that's been measured by these satellites. And you can see that it, there's a strong cycle. It's an about 11 year cycle um, in terms of solar output, but there's no trend over this interval. So this is an example of how there isn't a correlation between something that people might think obviously has an impact on climate um, and we can rule it out in this case. So changes in Earth's orbit are also something that I, that I hear about because the relative position of how the Earth moves around the sun, of course, is very important for how much or for what our planet's temperature is. Um, the tilt of our Earth on its axis, of course, determines our seasons. And if someone has heard about the ice ages in Earth's past, they know that those ice ages are related to changes in, in the shape of Earth's orbit around the sun, determining how much energy we actually receive from the sun. Um, but it turns out that these are very, very slow changes. And we also know very well how they occur. So we can really precisely calculate um, how Earth's orbit has varied both in the past and how it will vary into the future. Um, and we can see that there's just no way that these kinds of changes could be related to warming that we're seeing over, you know, a, a century to even decadal timescales. Let's see. So, um, you know, this kind of just goes into an emphasis more about this point that I mentioned earlier that people have sometimes heard about the ice ages and use this as an example that 
climate varied naturally in the past when humans weren't causing those changes. And that's absolutely true, um, but should be in no way confused as though to say somehow that it suggests that we're not driving changes today. And in fact, when scientists study past episodes of climate change, it actually reinforces to us the link between carbon dioxide and temperature. Uh, so the, the example of the ice ages are a really classic one. This little graph here that's in the upper corner shows on the top a reconstruction of, of surface temperatures um, over Greenland and on the bottom re is reconstructed carbon dioxide in the atmosphere from ice core measurements. And basically what you're seeing here is if we're starting over on the left side of the graph, that's today, and then moving to the right is moving back in time by 800,000 years. And you see CO2 going up and down along with temperatures going up and down. And we can so really strongly see this link between how much carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere and global temperature. So you know, rather than telling us that somehow it means that humans aren't important, it really emphasizes to us that CO2 is a very significant factor for global temperature through time. Um, and we can actually go back even further in the past than that. And, and this is especially useful if we want to put into context our 400 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere today. Um, this little graph now shown on the right hand side of the slide are reconstructions of both uh, first temperature uh, on the left and then, um, or sorry, temperature on the, on the right and atmospheric CO2 on the left um, by more indirect measurements than what we can do using ice cores. Um, if we go back more than about a million years ago, we, we can't get ice from which we can measure CO2 directly. So we have to use all of these more indirect estimates of carbon dioxide concentrations. And that's why you get these big error bars, the gray lines on either side of the data set. But the key point I want to make here is that if you look at the scale on the top horizontal bar, um, if you want to get above 400 parts per million, the 500 is the first little tick mark. Now look at this vertical axis. You have to go down millions of years until you're confidently really above that line. Um, and actually, if you think about the levels of CO2 that we predict to see by say mid to the end of the century, um, if we continue our current rate of emissions, you actually have to go back about 50 million years to get to levels of CO2 in the atmosphere that reach that value. And correspondingly, we can see that what was happening to global temperature across this interval is it's, it's going up and up as we move back in the past. Um, and so again, over many different geologic timescales, we can see that there's this close correspondence between carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and global temperatures. All right. So some more, some more details about the, the temperature change that we've seen so far. Um, this is a nice graph that just sort of summarizes the temperature change from the pre-industrial or sort of the beginning of the industrial period up to today. Um, and again, we, we give these measurements by talking about the global temperature relative to some average or baseline period. So we take average temperatures, usually for about a 20 year interval, and then we ask whether any given year is warmer or colder than that average. Um, and so by doing that, we can see that we've had about a degree Celsius, about twice, almost twice that in degrees Fahrenheit of warming since um, the late 1800s. Okay, so now, you know, this is, this is all sort of straightforward stuff from the scientific perspective. So let's talk about the difference between the scientific consensus a little bit and what, you know, often gets discussed in the media um, or in the public. So I like this. I'm, I'm not sure who made this little feature or cartoon. It wasn't me, though, but it's a, a tree that's supposed to reflect um, basically disbelief um, among actual climate scientists that the climate is has detectably warmed as a consequence of human emissions of CO2. Uh, the green leaves are the scientists who are convinced that that is the case or that that is detectable, we should say. And the reds are the climate scientists who are not convinced. And so I like this because it demonstrates that overwhelmingly climate scientists agree that our emissions of CO2 have caused a detectable increase in global temperature. And I should add that the few outliers that exist often quibble with details rather than some of the fundamental aspects of the science. So they might say something like, well, I'm not convinced that the temperature change that we've detected so far is obviously 
you know, larger than natural variability. They're not arguing with the basic point though that CO2 is a greenhouse gas and can drive warming. Or they'll say, well, I think that in our present, present Earth system, um, the negative feedbacks will be so strong that the actual warming will be very, very minor. So it, it's really important to kind of emphasize that some of these fundamentals are not even what the few remaining um, doubters within the scientific community are, are worried about. It's, it's important to emphasize that point, I think, because, so if you're not familiar with it, the Yale Climate Communication Project is a really nice tool. Um, and actually, I, I should go back because I like to regularly check whether these percentages are the most up-to-date because they're always releasing new versions. Um, but they do a combination of surveys and then also modeling to try to get a sense of what the perceptions of the American public are regarding climate change. And happily, from my perspective, and probably everyone on this call, of course, is that more and more Americans will say that they believe that climate change is happening, now a majority do, and, and a slight majority will say they believe it's caused primarily by human activity. However, where we still have this, this minority position is that most Americans don't realize that there is this strong scientific consensus. They think that climate change is somehow still this really actively debated topic among scientists. And so I sometimes think that that is a really important point to emphasize because that's where there's this confusion or uncertainty that really remains. All right, so we're gonna go through just some commonly asked questions that I, that I hope address things that, that maybe people are wondering about. And then of course, I'm happy to open it up uh, to some broader, any questions that anyone on the call has as well. Went away. Exactly. How warm have we been getting? Um, I like to point people to the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies, or NASA GIS, which is based in New York City. Um, they release a lot of, you know, of these updates, models of global temperature reconstruction. This little video that's showing observations that have been turned into this, this animation of how temperature has been changing comes from the NASA GIS website. And, and every year they'll do press releases of how, you know, what is the global average temperature this past year and how does it compare to all of their records. And we keep getting these, these record breaking years. So right now the warmest year on record is 2016. Um, 2017 I think was the second warmest year. 2018 might have been the third warmest year. And so you see this variability because you have natural climate phenomena still affecting global temperature, but you see this extremely strong trend when if you take just the past 22 years and 20 of those were the warmest years in, in all of the records. So it's really, these are impressive metrics. And I think when you make them into these visuals like this video, you can really strongly see more and more of the globe turning these oranges, yellows and reds that indicate warmer than average conditions. Um, and a huge amount of data underlies those, um, those measurements as well. Um, some other visuals that I think are really important to show is the Keeling curve, which shows the changes in atmospheric carbon dioxide that we've been measuring since the late 1950s. And we could only measure, um, or scientifically, we only developed the capability to measure how much CO2 is in the atmosphere directly in the late 50s. And so you can see here that we already were well above that pre-industrial 280 parts per million by the time that these measurements began. Um, and we can see the steadily increasing value since then. And these measurements are ongoing. Um, and so that's a really nice visual because it's a really profound driver of the climate system that you can couple then to something like this map that shows the global temperature change that's resulted over that over the sort of time period in which we've been emitting carbon dioxide. There are sometimes you get questions again about changes in greenhouse gases before we, those measurements came into being in the 1950s. Um, and the answer is that we can now, of course, go back in time again, as I mentioned, by using these ice core records. So I talked before about the very, very long term, but this is zooming in on a, on a bit more recent interval. This is an interval called the Holocene, which is just the last 11,000 years where we've seen the rise of all human civilizations. And these three plots are showing how these three dominant greenhouse gases changed in their concentration of the atmosphere as reconstructed from ice core measurements over that interval. Carbon dioxide is there in green at the top, 
methane is in the middle in orange and the bottom is nitrous oxide. And at the very, very end for our last century, you can see the sharp upward increase from all of these gases, but otherwise you can see a relatively stable concentration through all of the time at which we saw the development of civilization. Um, and again, corresponding with those very relatively flat changes in, in carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases, we can similarly go back and use indirect methods to reconstruct temperatures through this time. Um, this is a slightly different interval, but this is just focusing on the last thousand years and gives an example of temperature reconstructions that all, again, show this upward trend um, in the last century pasted on to previous centuries of much more relative stability. Um, there's uncertainty in these estimates the further back you go in time. Um, cumulatively, this graph has been referred to as something called the hockey stick because of its shape, the idea of relatively flat temperature change and then the sharp upward trend at the very end. Um, and a lot of climate skeptics have attacked the hockey stick curve but its findings have been reproduced again and again, um, culminating in actually a study by the National Academy of Sciences commissioned in 2006 to review the state of the science that concluded that the science had been done correctly um, and that the, all of the available data suggested the anomalous nature of warming of the last century compared to the last millennium. Um, and we can, of course, even more directly account specifically for the fact that the CO2 increase in the atmosphere is coming from fossil fuels rather than some other natural mechanism. I mean, this might seem obvious because we know we're burning all of this coal, oil, and natural gas. We know that when you burn that material that releases carbon dioxide, and yet I still sometimes hear things about, well, couldn't the CO2 be from volcanic eruptions or something like a volcanic eruption is much more important. And, and actually, volcanoes release about 100 times less CO2 per year than humans do at the present rate. Um, but beyond that, we can actually look at distinct chemical fingerprints of carbon dioxide that we find in the atmosphere and relate it to the various sources where that CO2 could come from. And that's what's shown here on these graphs. So these are just measurements over the last few decades, there's the Keeling curve again in green for the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. There's an oxygen plot, or I think, is that oxygen? Yeah, oxygen plot that is sort of an unrelated to this particular point. But on the bottom panel, this little delta notation, little Greek delta, this is, this is telling us a little bit about, the, as I said, the chemical composition, in this case, the isotopic composition of the CO2 that we're measuring in the atmosphere. The fact that it's been changing is because CO2 released from fossil fuel burning has a very different composition than the CO2 that was in the atmosphere to start with. And so as you, as you it's like, you know, imagine putting a different colored dye in, into a, a tank of water, you know, it'll get redder and redder and redder. That's kind of similarly what we're seeing with the change in this, this uh, fingerprint of atmospheric CO2. And yet we, despite the fact that we've already released a lot of CO2, we could actually release much, much more. So I've been using some of these different metrics, but just as a reminder, a gigaton of carbon, which has this uh, abbreviation GT, is 1 billion metric tons of carbon. Um, we release about 10 gigatons of carbon in CO2 per year, close to 40 um, gigatons of CO2 per year, because you include the oxygen. And again, that drastically is greater than emissions from volcanoes. If we add up all of the CO2 that we've released so far by fossil fuel burning, that's about 300 billion tons since the mid 1800s. Um, if we continue burning carbon at the rate we've been going, we'll easily surpass 1,000 billion tons by the end of this century. But we have reserves of fossil fuels. If we just take what is currently known in terms of coal, oil, and natural gas, and this number is predominantly coal, we would have about 5,000 billion tons of carbon that we could potentially burn and release the CO2 to the atmosphere. Um, so even though we've already created quite a problem, the problem won't go away because we run out of fossil fuels to burn. And if we continued to release carbon at the rate we've been going, what would the implications of that be? Well, I like to look at, at two different scenarios for comparison. And that's what's shown in these two global maps of predicted temperature change by the end of this century. And the map on the left is showing a scenario in which effectively 
by the end of this decade, by next year, we stop um, increasing emissions of CO2 and we actually begin to sharply decline our emissions. Um, and that will keep temperature change minimized, although it doesn't eliminate it entirely. You can see that, of course, everywhere has still warmed compared to um, this sort of baseline period. In that case, we have significantly more global temperature change. Um, you see some spots of the globe that are experiencing 10 degrees of global warming. And again, here you can really see that feature where warming occurs more strongly at the high latitudes um, than the global average. So I, I often find that when I you know, talk about climate change, it, it, it can be obviously a very challenging topic and one that leaves people feeling very dejected or disheartened. So, you know, all, as CCL volunteers, we're trying to put a positive spin on things and say, you know what, this is a serious problem, but we've recognized it and we, we have something that we know that we can do. And I didn't get to get into this in detail, but, you know, what we know is that the sooner that we can have emissions of carbon dioxide peak and begin to decline, the better off we are. And that's exactly what the carbon fee and dividend proposal is meant to do. It's meant to have us peak our CO2 emissions and begin to reduce them rapidly. Um, and that prevents the most extreme scenarios of warming and therefore the most extreme um, impacts of climate change. Uh, people often wonder, you know, can you ever get um, a problem that's so diffuse and widespread caused by all of our activities um, to be corrected. And I like to look at the ozone hole as a, as a positive story um, because this is, has a lot of parallels, right? Um, so ozone is a molecule that's three atoms of oxygen that's formed by the interaction of UV light in our upper atmosphere with oxygen gas or O2 in the atmosphere. Um, and it's always being created and destroyed. Um, it, but it's extremely important uh, because the ozone in our atmosphere is protecting us from harmful ultraviolet radiation from the sun. So we, we rely on ozone, not just when we're thinking about our own health, you know, if, if we have, have too much UV exposure, it's, it's carcinogenic, but, but even other ecosystems. So for instance, we know that as, um, you know, the productivity, how much photosynthesis happens in the ocean is really, really sensitive to, to UV. Um, and so ozone is critical for protecting, you know, all living things on the planet from the harmful effects of the sun. Um, well, unfortunately, um, towards the, the, you know, later half of the last century, uh, some really bright chemists created what they thought at the time was a, a miracle compound of chlorinated fluorocarbon, fluorocarbons, or CFCs, and they are this non-toxic, non-flammable molecule, so, so it didn't appear initially to have any negatives, and it was used for many, many different things. CFCs were used as refrigerants, they're effective propellants for aerosol spray cans, um, they were used in plastic generation for, for dry cleaning, I mean the list sort of goes on and on. Um, the problem is, and it wasn't discovered until decades after their widespread manufacture, when CFCs are, are released into the atmosphere, they're actually broken down by UV light, um, releasing chlorine atoms that then destroy ozone molecules. And that kind of sequence of events is what's shown in this little cartoon. Um, and so scientists realized pretty quickly we had a serious problem on our hands, that the continued use and release of CFCs was leading to a depletion of um, atmospheric or stratospheric, upper atmospheric ozone that could have devastating effects by exposing people and ecosystems to greater amounts of UV. Luckily, uh, that was frightening enough for the global community for governments to get together and really think we need to do something about this. And really within a few years of the recognition that there was significant ozone depletion, particularly over the, the Southern Hemisphere, um, there was a meeting internationally in which um, Countries adopted something called the Montreal Protocol, really just a few years, again, after the ozone hole was discovered, like you can see in this graph, this is the chlorofluorocarbon content in the atmosphere is changing through time. Um, and then after the Montreal Protocol was adopted, which included phasing out the use of these damaging CFCs, you can see that the concentration starts flattening out. So our emissions drop dramatically and Therefore, you sort of stabilize how much 
CFCs are in the atmosphere. And we can already see the recovery of ozone in the atmosphere as a consequence. So um, for, for various kind of uh, dynamics reasons that I won't get into in too many details, like I said, the depletion of the ozone was really particularly extreme over the Southern Hemisphere. And so that kind of coined the term of the ozone hole. It's this region of reduced ozone concentration, again, and, and that really was centered over the Antarctic continent. Um, but it's been recovering and should recover fully by the mid to late century, this century. Um, again, because we took such rapid action to reduce our CFC emissions and level off and ultimately then have those concentrations decline um, once we discovered the problem. So, you know, this is not an exact parallel. Obviously, uh, CFCs have a different lifetime in the atmosphere than CO2. Um, they have different kinds of consequences. But I like the general analogy that says there was a global problem recognized that was directly tied to um, human activities, economic activities. When we saw evidence of the problem and decided to act on it, we had a big impact and we've, we've already been sort of seeing ourselves correct that situation. Um, and so similarly, if we take action to limit CO2, um, the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere will begin to stabilize um, and then we can really minimize the impact. So a couple tips that I'd like to wrap up with that are really just about, you know, ways to communicate about climate science and also maybe to learn a bit more about climate change. Um, the, the first thing is I, you know, I went in, in this talk as sort of an interested audience, a lot more detail. You know, I think that in general, you know, when you're talking to someone, especially if you're at a tabling event or something short, you want to focus on just these kind of really key points. Um, human activities are releasing CO2, causing the concentration of CO2 to rise. That CO2 traps heat. Um, we know this from many, many, many different scientific studies. When we talk about science, what's, what science knows, we're referring to a body of literature, published peer-reviewed literature that's been built up over decades and decades, not to individual opinions. So, I, I mean, you might have noticed a couple times tonight, you know, I try to separate or divide when I'm saying something that's the science as opposed to saying something that's kind of my opinion or interpretation of something, um, because those are nuanced. They're not the same thing. You know, you always want to go to something that can summarize the scientific literature. Um, and that's why things like the IPCC or the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change are great. They're not individual scientists. They are big groups of scientists who are called upon to not even talk about what they do, but to summarize what's been published um, in the previous seven to eight years, and then provide that as a resource um, to the public to understand what do we know or don't know about climate change. Um, and I think also, you know, you want to focus on solutions at the end of ever talking about climate change. The, if you like the ozone hole story, I think that one's useful to use. Um, but you could also just, again, talk about that we know that we can really, we can slow down this problem um, with existing technology if we put in place policies that disincentivize burning fossil fuels, um, and that we can really, really reduce the impacts of global warming um, as a consequence of that. So uh, that this slide, along with the speaker notes, really has three recommendations that, as any CCLR, um, you know, has heard before in a new rendition that the climate advocacy really keys in on about communicating about science. And they are the use of metaphors and analogy. You know, a recent TED Talk, one of the links that we can put in here tonight, explains it by uh, saying that weather compared to climate is climate is your personality, weather is your mood. You know, being able to have a way of communicating something to help other people widely understand it through another common experience they have and that can be repeated is very sticky. So that's key in finding your own ways of doing that in describing these concepts. Showing versus telling is really emphasizing the importance of visuals. And I'll leave that to Sandy to really highlight some of her favorite recommendations. But we do have a, a link to an updated New York Times um, series of charts. Um, it's to Neil tonight. There's a bunch of other resources we'll highlight on the importance of using visual communication.
And then lastly, this e pluribus unum uh, phrase out of one, uh, out of many, one, is just really getting at, you know, the scales that Sandy has been talking about tonight can often seem overwhelming, distant, hard to reach. The important thing is not only to communicate big numbers that might be hard to wrap people's heads around, uh, but also just telling the story of your own impacts and really being able to highlight the personal journey or the, the kind of suffering or the impacts that other people that you have heard of or read of. You know, this could mean telling the story of a child with asthma um, on or the impacts of wildfires on a local town's economy. Whatever it is, making it local and personal is essential. Thanks, Brett. I, I completely agree. Your own, own personal stories or experiences are always really powerful. That's been my experience. Um, I kind of wanted to just give a, a quick, uh, very quick primer on a resource that I think people are often not very familiar with, um, but that's a way to quickly access this, this peer reviewed literature that I kept mentioning and that's using Google Scholar. Um, Google Scholar these days for scientists is really the first thing we turn to for finding up to date publications. Um, so again, that's just scholar.google.com like on the address on the slide. And you use it just like you would use regular Google with keywords of things you're interested in. So maybe you type in hurricanes and climate change because you want to understand the connection between whether hurricanes are becoming more intense or more frequent, for instance, with climate change. And the key point here is that this is going to take you to the actual literature um, as opposed to doing a more kind of questionable web search where you might get to some not particularly well vetted resources. Um, these can be quite dense articles, but usually they have a short summary at the beginning that can kind of give you the gist of the topic. Um, but another really useful thing about doing this is it's a way to find out the, the names of individual scientists who are doing research in areas that you might be curious about. Um, I, you know, you sort of be surprised by how few people actually, I think, reach out to, to a lot of individual climate scientists. There are maybe a handful of names that are of people that have really put themselves kind of out into the public sphere so they're more well known. Um, people like Gavin Schmidt or Michael Mann. Um, and so they get a lot of emails. But there are many, many, many climate scientists out there doing, doing the research, publishing on it. And they're usually very happy to answer questions or explain the details of their research in layman's terms. And so I really encourage people to just just email the authors of, of articles of something that you are really curious about. So if someone has written a paper um, on hurricanes and climate change, their email will be on that paper. And you could send them an email with just a question of clarification. And, and I think you'd be surprised by, by how many um, replies you get. Um, and it's also actually a way to maybe find out that there's someone who lives nearby to you um, at a local university that's doing this work and could be a, a world expert in the area um, that you might end up being able to then reach out to for you know coming to a CCL event that you're hosting or some other kind of um, you know kind of event environmental event in your community uh, I know I have a lot of colleagues that we, we like to do this sort of thing so it's it's just a way to find people Sandy this is just a short link people have been asking um, about some of the resources and recommendations I put those in the chat I'll do that again here at the top. Do you want to say anything more about the power of visual information before I kind of uh, wrap up with somewhere to go here? Um, I think you did a really nice summary. I mean, I, I'm glad you put this link for the New York Times. Um, another just one that someone, the National Geographic is wonderful for some really great visuals about climate change. So I highly recommend their website. Um, if you just search through it for climate change, you'll find, you'll find tons of visuals. Um, but again, as I said, it's often useful to go directly to the scientific agencies that are producing these things. So I mentioned the NASA Goddard Institute earlier, um, and they're, they're a wonderful place to go for these videos and, and photos of global temperature change on these maps. Um, and also the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, has a lot of visuals as well. Um, so there's really these days no lack for being able to go out there and find some really well-made, um, you know, uh, cartoons or graphs or videos uh, that you can use in presentations. Is just uh, if you have any questions or feedback for Sandy or I, here is our contact information. We'd love to be in touch with you, and we really appreciate your leadership on this issue. We hope you found tonight's webinar useful.
And uh, we wish you luck in reaching out to climate scientists in your area and using these recommendations with your own communication. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thanks, Ezra. Thanks, everyone.